In this lecture, we'll take a brief look at the history of sound recording in the U.S. In 1877, Thomas Edison discovers a way to record sound and records Mary Had a Little Lamb on the first working phonograph, but the quality is very poor. The photo on the right actually shows Edison's second phonograph and was taken in 1878 by Matthew Brady, the famous photographer credited with documenting the Civil War. By 1885, rival inventors to Chester Bell and Charles Tainter invent the graphophone. Like Edison's phonograph, the graphophone creates sound as an engraved wax cylinder rotates against a stylus. Edison responds in 1887 with a battery-driven phonograph with better quality. But none of these devices qualify as vehicles of mass communication. In 1888, Emil Berliner invents the gramophone, which uses a flat disc rather than a wax cylinder as the recording medium. The disc can hold up to two minutes of recorded sound. The manufacturing process is such that Berliner can mass-produce discs in vulcanized rubber. This discovery is important because it marks the beginning of the recording industry. Here's what a 1900 recording made on a Berliner gramophone sounds like. The Columbia Phonograph Company, which wasn't very successful against its competitors, tries something new to boost sales. It begins to record music to send to fairgrounds so that the music can be played on machines like the one pictured on the right. The fairgrounds had to lease the machines from Columbia and fairgoers could drop a nickel into the machine to hear it play a song. This is, of course, the birth of the nickel jukebox. The jukeboxes become popular enough to help Columbia survive tough economic times in the 1890s. Though the jukeboxes were extremely popular, sales were limited because it was still difficult to mass produce the wax cylinders of recorded music. At the turn of the century, developments in recording technology improved the quality and therefore the demand for recorded music. At the same time, mass production techniques improved and the music business takes off. In addition to the gramophone and graphophone, the player piano becomes one of the most popular automated music media of the time. However, the unexpected boom in pre-recorded music leads to questions over copyright infringement. After several court battles, the Supreme Court finally determines that royalties must be paid to music publishers for each reproduced song. Advancements in disc technology result in the invention of the 78 RPM disc. The 78 produces a much better recording than the wax cylinder, and so the wax cylinder is finally retired. The Victor Talking Machine Company introduces the Victrola, which is a phonograph designed to fit within the home. The Victrola becomes the best-selling record player of its time, and with the production of 78 records, the music industry takes off. Also around 1906, Canadian scientist Reginald Fessenden used a microphone and transmitter to broadcast the first music on the radio. Essentially, Fessenden becomes the world's first DJ. Probably no one knew at that time that radio and the music recording industry would forge a symbiotic relationship that, although sometimes an uneasy relationship, would last for more than a century. By the 1920s, the Radio Corporation of America or RCA, had begun mass-producing commercial radios. 
In Pittsburgh, well, technically East Pittsburgh, the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company also began to manufacture radios. It was natural for Westinghouse to begin making radios for a few reasons. First, Westinghouse had received a contract from the U.S. government to make radios for the military to use during World War I. The war was over, and when the world ended, Westinghouse already had the equipment to make radios for household use. Also, the popularity of radios was increasing. Although the only people transmitting anything at that time were doing so more or less as a hobby. In addition to already having the manufacturing equipment to make radios, Westinghouse also already had a radio station. It had been used as a method of communication between the various branches and locations of the company, sort of like an intranet of today. Westinghouse converted their in-house radio station to a commercial radio station we know today, primarily so people who bought Westinghouse radios would have something to listen to. And thus, KDKA in Pittsburgh becomes the first commercial radio station complete with call letters. It began regular broadcast by announcing the returns of the presidential election. Not long after that, Musicians began performing live in radio stations, and people were happy to listen to the broadcasts. But the news was not good for record manufacturers because record sales plummeted as a result of radio's growing popularity. After all, why would people pay for records and phonographs when they could hear music for free on the radio? To fight the slump in record sales, the record industry created a better product and increased the quality of its recordings at record players, and sales picked up. Record and phonograph companies also figured it, that if they couldn't beat radio stations, they'd join them, sort of, and the phonograph companies began acquiring radio networks. For example, the Victor Talking Machine Company merged with NBC Radio Network and became Radio Corporation of America, otherwise known as RCA. Similarly, Columbia Phonograph Company acquired a radio network and became CBS, which stands for the Columbia Broadcasting System. The symbiotic relationship that developed between the radio and record industry went like this. The radio programs needed music to play for their audiences. And the audiences were needed so that advertisers could have someone to listen to their ads. The record industry needed to sell records. And so the record companies provided free music to radio stations. The radio stations in turn gave the music airplay which essentially served as free advertising for the record and phonograph industry. Early on, radio stations also featured live musicians, but this served as free record advertising as well. People would hear their favorite singer on the radio and then rush out to purchase their records so they could listen whenever they wanted. The symbiotic relationship went like this. Recording companies give free records to radio stations in hopes that they'll make the playlist. Radio stations have music to draw their listeners, and advertisers will pay for ads for those ears to hear. Another way to look at it is like this. Radio provided people with the opportunity to hear their favorite songs, but only when the radio station chose to play them. Listeners were at the mercy of the DJ's playlist unless those listeners took matters into their own hands and purchased records of their favorite songs. During the Great Depression, the music industry suffers. Although some improvements are made to the quality of records at this time, no one had any money to buy them. So the record industry stagnates as listeners instead take advantage of free radio broadcasts. Record sales decline again. Coincidentally, tape recording cartridges are developed in 1930, but tapes remain largely behind the scenes during the Depression and actually into the 1950s. No one has money to buy such things. 
Frequency modulated radio or FM radio, once believed to be an impossibility, becomes a reality in 1933. FM radio, compared to AM radio, offers higher fidelity sound with less static and it requires less transmittal power. It is the natural choice for music. Unfortunately, the music industry giant RCA was making money from AM radio and television broadcasting and saw FM as competition. So RCA launched a campaign to smother FM radio. The company did indeed succeed in crippling the emerging FM market. It takes decades for FM to fight its way back to being recognized as a high-quality radio technology. Though the cassette tape cartridge was invented in 1930, it is slow to enter the recorded music industry as a viable format. And it wasn't until 1951 that American inventors introduced the first portable audio tape recorders. Soon tapes are being mass-produced, and they cost less than vinyl record albums, with the price of a blank tape around $3 and a vinyl album at $6 by the end of the 1960s. The record companies start to worry about the recordable cassettes affecting their sales. They were beginning to have a sense of what the word piracy meant. In 1966, Eight-track tapes are developed, and soon the eight-track player is introduced as an option in Ford cars. This does much to increase the sales of eight-track tapes. In 1971, the U.S. Congress declares that sound recordings are worthy of copyright protection, and Congress passes the 1971 Sound Recording Amendment to the 1909 Copyright Statute. The passage of the law was in response to the music industry's complaint about music piracy. Record executives complained that teenagers taped and swapped their favorite albums on cassette tapes, which really was rather easy to do. By the late 1970s, music sales slide, and the record companies begin an industry-wide campaign to curb home taping. But cassettes are in high demand thanks to the introduction of the Sony Walkman in 1979. The Walkman revolution coincides with improvement in cassette sound quality, and the cassette tape suddenly becomes the only format you could have in your home, in your car, and in your pocket. The Recording Industry Association of America, or RIAA, which is the recording industry's lobbying and trade organization, fought for a tax to be placed on blank tapes and legislatures eventually grant the music labels a portion of every blank tape sold. This money from the sale of blank tapes was supposed to make up for all the money the record companies and musicians were losing due to piracy. In 1982, Billy Joel's album titled 52nd Street becomes the first CD released in the world. By 1988, the CD surpasses the long-playing record in sales. With the introduction of the CD, the 80s become the most explosive boom period in recorded audio history. Customers felt that they needed to replace their vinyl collection with CDs and, of course, They had to buy CD players as well. The next recording format to be developed after the CD was the DAT, or digital audio tape. The DAT was superior in sound quality, but the record industry was so afraid that people would simply pirate music onto DATs that they fight the release of the DAT. Record companies don't want it released until the government promises to give the companies Part of the sale price of each DAT tape or DAT tape recorder sold. Like with the sale of cassette tapes, the record companies want this money to compensate for the pirated music they know the DAT will allow people to steal. The fight goes on without resolution for so long that the manufacturers of DAT tapes and DAT tape players run out of funds and give up. The DAT is never introduced into the commercial market. The format is formally called the Moving Picture Experts Group 1, Layer 3, 
but we know it as the MP3. The MP3 compresses digital audio files by a factor of 12 to a size that can be easily sent from computer to computer without compromising quality. Because it compresses music into small digital files, the MP3 player is much smaller than the portable CD player. This makes music portable. The players are so small they can easily be tucked into a pocket. Around this time, the fear of music piracy heats up enough that the U.S. government steps in. The legislature passes the Audio Home Recording Act of 1992. At this time, it was very easy for regular people to pirate music in their own homes with the use of a digital recorder. The Audio Home Recording Act forces the people who manufacture the digital recorders to pay a 2% royalty rate to copyright holders. This is done to compensate for the piracy that's going on. In addition, digital audio recording devices are required to include a device that prohibits copying. In 1993, the music industry files one of the first lawsuits against the online service CompuServe on behalf of more than 140 music publishers. The suit argues that CompuServe's music forum allows users to download music files without the consent of the copyright owners. The suit is settled in 1995 when CompuServe pays the music publishers more than $600 per each song that was allegedly pirated. I have no idea how they determined which songs were pirated. Many, many other lawsuits follow as the music industry fights music piracy. Technology takes another step forward when music can be streamed rather than downloaded. Real Audio successfully launches the first major streaming audio service in 1995. In comparison to the long wait associated with downloading a music file, streaming audio becomes highly popular, despite initial poor audio quality. In 1997, the band Duran Duran was set to release their new album, Medazzaland, for sale in retail stores. But before the album went on sale, Capitol Records let fans listen to a single song from the album online for free for two weeks. The free song was streamed, not downloaded, which was still quite revolutionary. But after the two-week free period, customers had to buy the song for 99 cents and download it. Capitol did this to test the waters, more or less, to see how online sales of songs might go. However, brick-and-mortar retail stores saw this as the beginning of a threat to their own sales. In August of 1977, Prince announced that his next album, Crystal Ball, would only be available via the internet or an 800 number. It would not go on sale in record stores. It's important to note that Prince produced and released the album on his own and not with a major record company. He'd had a contentious relationship with record companies in the past and decided that he didn't need them to produce and sell an album. The move was a symbolic statement that, in the Internet world, an artist can be free from the economic shackles of the record labels and record stores. He sold 100,000 albums, but without the aid of a record label, it wasn't easy. The experiment highlighted the difficulties of trying to create a new distribution service from scratch. In 1998, the Recording Industry Association of America accuses three Internet pirates of posting hundreds of songs online. The RIAA says that simply posting the songs online allows anyone to download the audio files for free. The accused pirates settle with the RIAA and, in exchange for agreeing not to post ever again, the RIAA waives their fines, which totaled well over $1 million per violation. The incident is the first serious act by the music industry to stop people from posting pirated music online. The RIAA later sets out to take legal action against those who download copyrighted songs as well. As of March 2004, 
the RIAA has tried to sue over 2,000 individuals for illegally sharing music on file sharing networks. In 1999, Sean Fanning and Sean Parker debuted the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network called Napster. Pirated music is freely shared on Napster. The RIAA sued Napster for copyright infringement, and so did the band Metallica and rapper Dr. Dre. In 2001, after years of legal battles, Napster is ordered to remove all copyrighted material from its network and the service shuts down in July 2001. Napster ends up paying the National Music Publishers Association $36 million. After Napster shutdowns, other peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services such as Kazaa, Morpheus, and Grokster spring up, but the music companies sue them as well. And eventually, Kazaa, Morpheus, Grokster, and the others run out of money to fight the legal battles, and they close up as well. In 2003, Apple launched the most successful online music store to date. In its first year, Apple sold 70 million songs at 99 cents per song, making nearly $70 million in legal internet music sales. By 2010, iTunes was the largest music retailer on the planet. According to Billboard magazine, it was the combination of all of the following that allowed iTunes to change the music industry in seven ways. iTunes was the first legitimate digital music store that competed effectively with piracy. Steve Jobs felt that if people could buy single songs rather than entire albums and download them into that nifty little portable device, the iPod, they would do that rather than steal music. And he was right. They did. The combination of iTunes plus iPod turned digital music into a fashion statement. It was cool to accessorize with an iPod. Digital music became ubiquitous through the combination of iPods and iTunes. People could take their music anywhere and weren't tied to a large PC to listen to music. People could run, skateboard, work out, paint the house, and really almost anything while listening to music iTunes leveled the playing field for independent labels and artists. Think of it this way. In a brick-and-mortar record store with only so much shelf space, independent labels and artists had little chance of being placed in prime spots on those shelves. Those prime spots, the ones where people's eye were most likely to fall, were reserved for big label record producers, and it was difficult for independents to get any exposure. But in the iTunes format, shelf space isn't an issue. Independent labels and artists appear alongside major artists. Steve Jobs told Musician that there'd be two things they had to accept. 99 cents for every single song, and every song had to be sold as a single. This standardized the price of a single song online at 99 cents. Essentially, by selling singles, Apple unbundled the album and allowed listeners to purchase only the music they really wanted. No longer did they have to purchase an entire album with maybe 10 undesirable songs in order to own the two or three songs they really liked. And finally, recording companies got paid much faster when transactions occurred online. There was no waiting for inventory to arrive at stores, no risk of CDs breaking en route, and no loss of product, so there was less waste. Online purchasing sped up the exchange of money dramatically, and recording companies and artists were paid more quickly. That's all for now. Thank you very much for your attention.